Hello, Christian boys and demigods with their nine-inch nails and little fascist panties sucked inside the heart of every nice girl. I'm Joey. I'm Matt. <laughs> I'm Kristen. Welcome to Messing with the Master, a podcast where three lifelong Tori Amos fans reflect on the iconic singer-songwriters catalog by thoughtfully and intentionally reorganizing each album into fresh playlists that explore Tori's musical legacy as well as our own interconnected personal narratives and friendship, which began with a shared passion for Tori's music over 20 years ago. This week's episode truly needs no introduction, so sit in the chair and be good now, and baby, don't look up, because we are messing with Tori's legendary debut, Little Earthquakes. In my heart, it's sick of being in Indeed, just like the album itself. Um, I'm really excited that we're doing this album now. I feel like it was smart of us to do things out of order because we got our feet wet and we um, can now tackle this, I mean, truly legendary album. This is a classic. This is, when you say classic, especially when it comes to debuts, um, this is in very rare company, I think. Right, um, yeah. and we say that with some bias, but I think that um, you know, um, music history and music criticism would be on our side here. Yeah, I mean, I think that a debut album, this strong, just from a composition standpoint, from a lyric standpoint, it's really the total package. Mm -hmm. It's it's everything you need to know about yeah. Tori Amos, encapsulated in an album. Um, and I think it's great because, you know, it does really introduce it's, it introduces Tori to the world. Obviously it's, mm -hmm. it's the origin story of Tori Amos in my eyes. And, yeah. you know, it's the first time we're hearing her and seeing her and she's so specific with the, the, the story and it's, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but she once said, um, you can write your diary once and then you have to move mm -hmm. on or something like that. And yeah. I think if you're going to write your diary in album form, Little Earthquakes is the way to go. Agreed. I agree. You know, a little fun fact about messing with the master <laughs> is this is our first lost episode. Is it not? <laughs> we flirted. How the sausage is made. Right. The mm -hmm. sausage was made here on Zoom once upon a time, and it was great. It was it was chemistry. It was magic. It was lightning. We're going to try to recreate. We haven't talked about our track listing since. I have no memory. I can't remember what anybody else said. These boys have a memory, so it's fine. But it's exciting to – this one I feel like we had to do really right, you know? Yeah. And the reason it's a lost episode is because we – did it thinking that it would be our first we thought we would debut with little earthquakes it went really well we worked out some kinks but the sound turned out to be kind of um a disaster we didn't want to put it out like that we didn't want to start on that note so we put it aside and we revisited it and that's what we're doing tonight um which is exciting and that that's also fitting of little earthquakes because um <laughs> as many know tori submitted and had the album rejected over and over again it's kind of become lore at this point but um you know it is one of those wild things where she was trying to do something and was being told no you can't over and over and um you know her uh something about little earthquakes feels um almost meta in its um in its composition because it is the story of trying in the face of rejection and oppression and abuse um and you know failing and rising and trying again and just sort of like um, systemic misogyny you know yeah oh yeah in the record industry in the world i mean you know i mean the just religion the, all of it yes it just the list goes on and on so it's meta in the sense that she was sort of you know or maybe you know uh matt might might run with this um 
a little bit, but like it also feels kind of uh, documentarian or something, right? Because she 100%. recorded this music over many years. She wrote it over many years. Now, she was 28 when it came out, but she was probably writing these songs from her early 20s. So this is really capturing. So we have the diary aspect, but also, you know, in some ways, um, it is the record that feels most. It has many producers on it. It has um, even like this sort of like, quality of some of the production differs from song to song because the songs were being recorded at different times with different budgets right um it's just such an interesting um artifact um but it comes together as this like really um kind of moment defining album in which she was you know it also straddles the 80s into the 90s right so she's sort mm -hmm. of bringing like 70s singer songwriter Carly Simon, Joni Mitchell, Ricky Lee Jones. She is, she's capturing some of that, um, but coming off of a very, very 80s effort with Why Can't Tori Reid um, that I think <clears throat> despite it being really uh, soul-crushing for her, taught her a lot about how to make an album. And she had some, you know, there were some like big producers working on that record. It wasn't like, you know, Why Can't Tori Reid was a, um, you know, something that she was making in her bathroom, Little Earthquakes was the album that was being made in the bathroom, right? Like, so it's a really interesting, um, like, back step in some ways in order to get somewhere further and deeper uh, lyrically and music-wise. So it's just an interesting trajectory. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I think you, you brought up something really interesting in that, you know, she's, you said it was a little bit of a, a struggle for Tori to get noticed for Tori to get attention of um, the record labels. And I think that's crazy because if Tori Amos, when she's, you know, in her twenties, can't get a record deal, mm -hmm. like what kind of world are we living in? What kind of hope does anyone right. have? Yeah. You know, this woman can sing her ass off at, you know, in the 1990s and play fearlessly. Plus there is that um, element of ambition that, you know, and not everybody who's talented makes it, of course, but people who are talented and whose, you know, singular mission in life is to, you know, make music and make art. Those are the people that succeed. And if a person like that can't succeed in the business, it's really, I think, telling of the time for women. Um, yeah. yeah. And also, I wanted to just say another thing that she did along with everything that you guys both talked about in terms of what this album is bringing to... Um, to the audience at this time, Tori was, I I think, and I, I'm not a music historian, I think probably the first woman to talk so directly through her music about sexual assault. And that struck such a chord. It was such a, a moment of confrontation and triumph. But I think people mm -hmm. had, you know, it, it's, it's a hard topic to talk about. Um, it's hard to make yourself that vulnerable. And it's hard to have people judging you as somebody who survived something so terrible. So that is a really important aspect of this album as well. Um, Tori's great contribution to um, stopping rape and sexual abuse in the world began with this album. Yeah, and we'll get more into it when we mess with the master. But I think that when you say that, it makes me really realize um i mean maybe it sounds obvious but when you really stop to think about it you realize how much of the record maybe every song on the record is um touched and impacted by the assault that she endured um even a song like leather which has sort of this like playful you know cabaret feel to it um a lot of that you know um a lot of that playfulness also is sort of entwined and like enmeshed with like shame and regret and, you know, thinking about one's own, um, one's own culpability in like within their sexuality. Right. Like there, there's that, that Tori I think has always been thinking about like, um, the, the degree to which women especially are um, made to feel like their sexuality is like it both belongs to 
the world, but it's supposed to be shielded from the world at the same time, and you're supposed to be kept, you know, demure, and um, you're supposed to hide your sex. Um, so it's it, it's the Madonna and the whore. Um, th- that is something that she's been sort of tangoing with um, from the start, and so you you really start to understand. And then you go to like the love songs, even, and like the 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 particular sadness on the album with a song like China. Um, when you think about it through the lens of that assault and the reverberations of it and the trauma from it, um, the songs really get painted in a different light. Um, and so, yeah, you're spot on about that. And it was shocking and it was, you know, um, it's one of those things where I think that she, I mean, she has spoken so much about it and uh, singing me in a gun so many nights in a row for so many years, I think, is part of the work that she's doing to heal herself, to put it out into the world, to raise awareness, to bring, you know, uh, thousands of people to a pin drop silent moment, you know, for seven minutes while she does that song or six minutes, whatever it is. Um, it, you know, was a remarkable feat. Um, but I, I think that it's, I hope that it's one of those um, fortunate occasions where she needed to, put that song out and it also was an occasion where putting it out would command the kind of attention that she deserved onto her music um and of course the irony being that it is the acapella the stark acapella song on an album by a piano prodigy that gets the attention and makes the waves and causes the controversy you know um uh me and a gun technically is the first single from this album. Technically, it was the first thing that was ever released, and we don't think about that because I don't know Wild. that. It, I don't think it was released in the States. I think it was over in the UK, but it's the first single, the first thing sent to radio is Me and a Gun and Son all these years together. Um, and that is wild. Um, and that was done with purpose and with intention and um, to do, I think, the very things that we are uh, talking about here. And it and it isolates the voice, right? It's it's the voice, it's the lyrics, it's the performance, it's the hurt, it's the it's the uh, confrontation of the song. Um, so it makes a lot of sense that what was really being pushed was this new voice as opposed to this new voice who's also happens to be one of the most amazing piano players who ever lived. Right. Like, so that came almost second to me and a gun. Um, and we forget about that so easily. Right. Isn't it crazy? What a world, like, I don't <clears throat> feel like in 2024 there would be a single, I mean, I guess we don't really have radio singles anymore. Right. Really. But say we did, I don't think it would be an acapella about a young woman's sexual assault. I don't see that happening. Well, it's, you know why? It's wild. I mean, nobody else can do something like that because Tori did it and broke the mold. I mean, this this is a this is a one of the most to me one of a kind things any artist could do as a statement about themselves, as an introduction to the world so personal so vulnerable so scary and yeah nobody would dare do something even close to that because tori owns the copyright for this particular sort of song i think you know i also think if we're imagining an alternate reality or another dimension like the multiverse and say tori amos were tori amos now in 2024 in some ways, um, if she were to do it, it would be she would release it on YouTube or TikTok or right. So mm. social media would get its uh, claws into it, and then it would be shared in that way. So in some ways, yeah. um, you know, Tori herself, I think, has said you know said as much that she um, feels great compassion for musicians now because the competition in some ways is fiercer because it uh, there are so many people who can put out music uh and it's being you know the internet's being scoured for new musicians all the time at the same time um somebody can do it themselves and not wait around you know like i can't even imagine what it must have been like for tori to like you know make demo records and then like mail them to fucking record companies right like have her dad like go somewhere and try to hand it to somebody like what a world right um but i think there were also fewer people in the mix 
who had the stomach to do that and were, you know, working as sort of aggressively as she was all those years. So um, in some ways, I think that a, a Tory now could could release a mean a gun and it would get out there. But I also wonder if um, the immediacy of the delivery of it and how it got to people would actually um, accelerate and then, and then see the demise of a career faster, right? Like mm-hmm. um, there's something about the, 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 the paces that Tori had to be put through um, that I think made her who she is um, and created that, she always had the work ethic, but I think that Little Earthquakes and the journey to it, and especially um, fighting for me and a gun and fighting for pianos on the record. You know, anybody who listens to this knows because this is the one that everybody knows. Everybody knows the Little Earthquakes. The famous but, story. But we, we all know the famous story about how they wanted to take off all the pianos and just replace them with guitars and what a fight she had to put up. Um, and what would have happened if they just simply said no to her? Like, no guitars no album right like what would she have done i kind of think she would have said fuck off and she would have just went away and tried again later that's my sense of worry found a way to make it happen herself even though it was so long ago and that was unheard of i just i mean matt you've obviously spent like personal time with her but she seems like a person (sighs) who is like on a mission like we've talked about this matt how she's on a mission she is driven if she has something to get into the world she'll find a way and i have so much respect for that especially because yes technology is different now and it's easier but it wasn't then there was and and there was less noise for sure i'm sure to break through to get a record deal but like trying like the like Mm -hmm. Even getting there, even being in the right places to have the right conversation must have taken so much. I just can't even imagine. Bow down to that lady. I wanted to just quickly throw in there that I do think that part of the um, mystique of that song um, is that Tori actually, with that song, built a community which is super interesting to me Mm. um that's much different from fan culture it's much different from uh even a shared experience because what she was doing was she was she was performing that song so much to so many people and that really is part of the legend too is hearing that song live and having a moment of identification with that song for a lot of people who felt underrepresented or not represented at all in terms of visibility um, in the music world, um, you know, and especially at that time where women, you know, were sexualized and, you know, not in a very nice way. And Tori experienced that firsthand herself. So um I do, right. I do think that the com- the community that she built with that song, it, almost like a little bit of a grassroots campaign that took on a legend of its own. Um, yeah. And again, nobody else has, I, I can't think of other people who have done that with one song necessarily, which, you know, the, the idea of what she built with um, Me and a Gun was one of the key, I, I hate to call it a selling point, but it was one of the key mm-hmm. talking points that, you know, convinced a lot of people um, to have her do the original song for Audrey and Daisy as well. So, you know, that was a big of part of yeah. you know, yes. yeah. plugging into Audrey and Daisy and that community that Tori has, you know, really been a leader in for 30 years now, which is so fascinating to me. So I do, I do think the live performance of the song um, from those first couple of years is really important to Tori's overall mythology. It's a really key piece of uh tory history um and then you know it's interesting to look later in life when she you know reinvents the song in 2007 with a band as pip and (laughs) goes to some really you just don't think she's going to go there and you know and then recently in 2022 when she performed it for the first time in a very long time. And it was a very different kind of performance. Um, I just, I I think about, you know, what it takes for a woman in her fifties to go back to that song all the time, like she does. And to, you know, somehow put on a show somehow, you know, bring her experience into it, somehow be nurturing it. It really is a, a lot that she has to juggle with performing that song, especially as the years go by, I think. Yeah. Um, 
it's funny that you say that because what what I kind of think about is like you said grassroots and it made me think it made me actually recall a story uh, from when I was younger um, that I'll tell you about in a second. But really, Tori um, was kind of behaving almost like a politician. She was doing all these really small rooms and really connecting with people. And, and I when I was in, I want to say the 11th grade, um, I had a I had a teacher. She was a history teacher, but she was teaching an elective called women in history. Um, and, uh, I had brought, I brought in Tori lyrics for something, I'm sure. And she said to me, Hey, you know, I actually met Tori Amos. And I said, Oh, you did what? And, and she was like, yeah, I was a student at SUNY Albany and she came to campus when her first album came out and she played this tiny space and she stayed after the show and just hung out and spoke to people. And she was like, she was really intense. So I could tell the, the teacher didn't really seem to care for her. She was like, you know, hmm. the music wasn't really for me. And she was kind of intense. But I really thought it was cool how she was just hanging around and chatting with people and like asking them questions about the music and the performance and like how they felt about it. And I'm sure that the bulk of that conversation was about me and a gun, right? Oh, um, yeah. People, so what, what she was sort of observing was probably intense conversations and probably gratitude for the song. Um, and I thought it was so wild. Like, imagine just years later, this is probably 1999 that she's telling me this story. So, you know, seven years later, eight years later, being like, oh, Tori Amos, yeah. Like, she was just <laughs> in the, you know, campus center singing, right? Um, and... I, when you say that, I realize that like, you know, and I say politician, not in the derogatory sense. I mean it in like the reaching out to people in the community, uh, trying to tell them that you understand and share their values and their concerns and their fears. Um, and that you want to form some sort of, you want to, you want to link arms to make some sort of change. Um, and so whether or not Tori realized that she was being such an activist, um, with that song, you know, she might not have called herself that until rain. And then she realized that what she was doing was activism and advocacy. Um, but whether or not she put a name to it in, in that sense, um, she was doing that. And so I think that's really spot on Matt. I think that, um, and she did the work, you know, and this is why meet and greets developed. And this is why like her, you know, like another piece of the Tori Amos lore begins with little earthquakes from that you know, talking to people like, you know, um, I don't know where, where dear Mike Y is these days, but the man who used to run the den, like, I'm pretty sure that was his like early interaction with her in a small space, you know, meeting her in 1991, um, 92 and, you know, befriending her. I know that, you know, beloved, um, Pat Kochi doll maker, like she, we love you, Pat. She, we love you, Pat, if you're listening. And she, I'm pretty sure she met Tori in those very, very nascent days as well. So there are people who've sort of had this, you know, close, casual thing with her before she really became Tori Amos. Um, and so obviously it is the start of all the things that we've come to associate with Tori, you know? I think all of those things are really right on. And then I would like to add to that, that also this album had to work. So she, like you said, she was out there putting in the work. Mm -hmm. She was hustling. She was out there yep. kissing oh, yeah. babies and shaking hands like a politician because this album had to work. There was <laughs> since a, she's, there was since a, she's 14. There was a, yeah. There was a lot riding on it though. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, why can't Tori mm -hmm. read? And then she got this and she was able to see it through and get it out there. And that is an accomplishment in itself and had nothing else happened and that album been released uh, just as a standalone album, it would still be what it is today, but it needed to be a commercial success. Yeah. And she worked really tirelessly to make sure it was. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I'm not saying this in a cynical way, but I do think that part of the strategy is that grassroots bit of it, right. Is, is meeting people and talking to people. Yeah. And I, and I always think like, you know, and I'm sure Kristen's going to agree with me here. Like if I put on a show or I'm doing anything in public, the last thing I want at the end of my performance mm -hmm. is for anyone to talk. Like I want to be alone. I want to have a chicken sandwich, you know, like, but yeah. she really, right. Yeah, like I, I think, I think that that had to, <laughs> you know, maybe it, maybe it was something that naturally evolved over the years, but I do think that I, I think 
meeting people and reaching out to people. It, it is in her nature, obviously, to do that kind of thing. But I, you know, I, I have to believe that that had to have been part of their strategy once things started catching on. You know, I think it's important. Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you yeah. explain, how do you explain to people what Tori Amos is? How do you explain to people what she sounds like, what the music is like? And I think that that was part of it. Like, you have to just see her. I'm sure she was doing a lot of showcases for people in the industry, right? Like, you know, those things where you perform in hotel rooms. And, um, you know, she was doing that as late as Scarlet's Walk. I know that she was, like, in, like, New York City hotel rooms and L.A. hotel rooms playing songs from the record, like, as if it was 1992 again um, for people in the industry. Um, and, And so it makes sense that people need to like experience it and understand it because it was so, uh, you know, I've used the word discordant a lot on this podcast, but it really does fit. Like she didn't quite, she didn't quite fit into the sound of what was, what was happening at all. And there were so few, uh, female singer songwriters on the radio at that point. Right. Like there was, um, Sinead O'Connor, Tracy Chapman, um, but not not much and not the way Tori sounded. And so um, it's like, how do you convince radio to play something that is so unfamiliar um, and is both a callback to something that's gone and a um, statement of something new and challenging? Um, and so I think that whether or not it was, if it, you know, like, because you're right, because she was like the meet and greet situation during her true heyday of the 96 98 it's kind of crazy that she was doing that um but it made sense that she was not saying okay no more of this i'm too big for this it made sense that she was like oh no like let's let's go out where there are 500 people screaming and crying and trying to you know speak to me and see me and snap a picture um it i'm i'm sure that eventually like you know I don't say ego in a bad way, but I think that, you know, she understood like, okay, this is something that I've created and I'm going to tend to this and I'm going to grow it and I'm going to pay attention to it um, and engage with it, not abandon it. Um, and, and things have sort of cycled around because now these sort of like fan artist connections are kind of part of the mainstream and like some very, very big successful musicians, younger musicians, you know, we're talking about Taylor Swift before, Though though they can't do it in the same way as Tori because they're just too big and too famous um, and it's too complicated, um, they are sort of whether they realize it or not they're they're taking a page from her playbook. They are you know doing paid meet and greet experiences or they are sort of creating fan experiences where fans get tickets for like a listening event and then maybe they show up and everybody freaks out and loses their mind and it goes on social media and it goes viral so they are borrowing some of that 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 thing that she sort of organically did um i think out of genuine curiosity and interest in engaging with people she wants she wanted people to be at her shows who wanted to hear what she had to say you know um and so it makes sense she would cultivate that i have a quick question to go back to for um i forgot where where i sort of alluded to it but i do want to ask you both about the sort of strategy about sending tori to England um, and what you think about it, particularly with the fact that she was she was inevitably getting Kate Bush comparisons hurled at her and they put her they sent her to Kate Bush land where (laughs) the British press was going to be extra hard on her. And obviously, regardless of what you think about the music uh, and the comparisons, you know, we can all agree that Cindy Palmano essentially pay tribute to or knocked mm-hmm. off the cover of the kick inside. So it was a very, it was a very clear homage or replica. Um, why did they do that? I'm curious. Genuinely, like, why would they throw her into, oh, you know I what I mean? I thought about this a lot. I thought why about this a lot. Why would they do that lot? to her? Yeah. Because, well, I'm sure that we'll all have different takes and I'm sure some are Okay, I don't know shit about the music industry, right? I work in marketing, but I think there is very much like a, like when there's a formula of something that works, like they just want to push it and it's easy. And it's like, it's, it's just part of the machine. And they were like, oh, we can feed more 
kooky piano player content into this and it worked here so let's do it again let's see if it can get even better response i think it's actually like i think that she made it work because she makes stuff work she makes stuff work with nothing and i love that about her but it could have gone really wrong i think it was a risk right i think all of those things are right and i would add that you know when tori was shipped over to England. Um, I think <laughs> it, it's it, it's becoming around the time, you know, when, when grunge is happening and things are starting mm-hmm. to pare down a little bit. So sending somebody who is a little outside of the mainstream to a place like England just adds to her quirky mystique, right? It You know, she's the you know, oddball redhead piano playing girl who now lives in England and she fits in just fine there drinking tea or whatever. Like the, the image, it, it all just seemed right. It added to her mystique that she would be in, in London and it made sense. Right. Yeah. I think, I think both of those answers make sense to me. Um, but yeah, it just seemed like, especially cause the, the British press can be so, cutting um so to have somebody that they could accuse or target and say she's trying to rip off our beloved you know patron saint of piano uh kookiness kate bush um was an interesting thing to do but maybe in what you're saying it makes a lot of sense Kristen. that um once she was doing her thing it became clear just how different she was. And also Tori talks about Kate Bush nonstop in early press. She, sure. we, people like we talked about this a lot over the years, especially at the, the aughts, how any um, female musician or singer songwriter in the nineties um, or late or, you know, the early aughts, if asked about Tori Amos, um, maybe besides Charlotte Martin, they would all, not answer or say kind of shitty things about the comparison because they didn't want to be compared to her. They didn't want to be told they were reminding anybody. And I don't think it was because they didn't respect her or know that she was incredible. It's just that they didn't want to have anybody say you are another version of this, uh, which I can understand. But Tori wasn't doing that. Tori was praising Kate Bush. Like she, she welcomed the comparison (laughs) And spoke of it in the same breath as she spoke about <laughs> Joni Mitchell, right? Um, she was very clear about the influences um, and how much she respected what Kate Bush was doing and, you know, loved Hounds of Love. So th- that was part of it, too. It was probably endearing to have her not shy away and be like, oh, Kate's amazing, you know? Like- I think the record label, and again, I don't know. This is just from the outside. Like, I think yeah. that they were willing to sacrifice her. I don't think that they necessarily... They didn't care necessarily. Care. Yeah. I don't think they wanted her to fail, but I think they were like, this is the market we where we think she'll sell. We'll put her here. And if she fails, no big deal. And Tori is Tori. So she was like, this is my shot. I got this. I'm going to make this happen. And she did. So there's that. And I think why Tori especially in the beginning, was willing to talk about Kate Bush as one. She w- she knew she was going to get the comparisons anyway. Right. Yeah. Two, right. she loved her music. But three, Tori is so <laughs> secure in her own right. musicianship and what she right. creates and what she brings to the table. That's what right. I love about her. And when I see, when I see any other musician perform, in- incredibly talented musicians, mm-hmm. there's just this like confidence and this relationship that she ha- and we we know this we all do that we all see her but just the relationship and the confidence she has with the audience with her instrument is unlike anybody else i've never seen it in any other concert other than stevie wonder who i was like this person is part of their instrument this is this is who they are in this moment this is how they they are alive I see yeah. everybody else kind of working for it, no matter how talented they are. Yep. Um, you see them working. Yeah, yeah, you see them working. I Stevie Wonder was the only other person I've ever seen where I was just like mouth open, like holy shit, this this is wild to see. Um, and I know we're biased, but there's something about her confidence and what she can do. And what she brings to the world generally that I just don't yeah. think exists. So that, I think that's why it's easy for her to talk, or at least it was easy for her to talk yeah. about Kate Bush then because she knew what she brought to the table. I yeah. respect that. I think it can get really um, complicated for women to discuss being compared to other women while speaking mm-hmm. to the press because there's not really yeah. a good, you know, it's it's hard to be 
if you're diplomatic, you know, you're you're not really owning it. I don't know. There's a lot of complicated layers that come along with having to be a woman responding to a question about another female artist that you're often compared to. I remember, I think it was in 2009, I asked Tori about PJ Harvey. And I know she was very, um, her answer was great. You know, there was, there was a great answer attached, but I know she was very clear at the beginning to say, I love her, but we do two, do, two we do two very different things. And right. I, I thought in that moment, like, oh shit, you know, like I, I hadn't thought about that because that it, it's a, a weird thing. You know, PJ and Tori don't necessarily for me do radically different things, but for her to have to make that, um, distinction has it, it really made an right. impression on me because ultimately when you're you know you know being a critic of something or you're trying to read something um i think it can get really easy to say you know i compare this to this it, it's what we all do right it's what critics do when they fail to write a really good film review is, you know, you're not going to compare <laughs> Citizen Kane to 2001 right. necessarily. It's its own thing. Um, and I think, right. you know, I think it's hard to, to do that with, you know, music and performers. Yeah. I also wonder if part of the stickiness there is that um, I think it still exists, but especially in that really like special moment of the nineties where you had a Bjork, a PJ Harvey, a Tori Amos, they were sort of the three, the three weird sisters or, you know, the three witches of Macbeth, um, who, um, had mostly an overlapping fan base, yeah. right? Like you were, you may have, a, one of them may have been your queen, but you rolled with the other two as well. Like that was true for the most part. Right. And then maybe you also were into Liz fair and maybe you were also then moving in, you know, to Alanis Morissette, which was a different version of it. Right. Like, um, but, but really it was the, tri you know, right, the trio was really PJ, Tori and Bjork. Um, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of mutual goodwill across those fan bases. Um, and so I think that that, conversation as it evolved was complex but i think for tori it was partly because she probably had great respect for them but she identified more with a Joni mitchell a leonard cohen um you know or even like you know when we'll get to you know, american doll posse soon uh but sort of those very male like the male feminine that you know of Led Zeppelin and those those guys that she loved, right? Who were sort of yeah, you know she she's referred to those men as goddesses. Like she she feminizes them, you know. Um, and also, I think she was really into pretty boy hair metal in the eighties. I think that <laughs> um, she's it's less Pat Benatar influencing Why Can't Tori Read than it is like White Snake or Poison, like or Bon Jovi. Death like Leopard. I think she is, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, like she was really responding, you know, you know, plus Prince. Like I think she was responding to like feminine, like feminine male or male feminine energy. Like sort of, it's not mm. not androgyny, but like sort of a, you know what I mean? Like sort of a small waisted leather pant wearing. It's like a Timothy Chalamet man. type. Yeah, but like I mean, you know, yeah, I know exactly. Sure. What you mean. Yeah, she yeah. she was she probably ident she identifies more with. So she had different. Um, she had different influences, right? So she was sharing a fan base with other incredibly talented, unique female musicians, but I don't think that she saw herself in those musicians. And that, that explains, I think, why Matt got that answer from her, right? Because she was like, they're great. We don't, I mean, she said it, you know, she said it herself in the Q magazine, you know, iconic uh, <laughs> cover story with the three of them, right? That she says that we have, you know, three holes and we sing and that's about it. Like the rest is different. Mm. And yeah. which was such wow. a, she, she was so, she was so much when she spoke like that and, and she's been doing it from the start. Um, but she, but she was right. You know, she was saying like, let us enjoy this conversation, but try not to. And that, and talk about going back to text and periodicals, uh, and pieces written by men. Um, <laughs> that, that's a pretty gross article when you read it. Like it is, really sexualizing them and really fucking misogynist really really badly and i think that put them in underwear basically on the yeah, front yeah 
And it's what Tori, I think, is, Stupid. you know, I think it's what she's responding to. She's responding to the the interviewer being um, being a shit, you know? Yeah. She brings she, that BTE, that big Tory energy, if you know what I mean. Yes. That's yes, yes, BTE. Yes. This is B-L-E, Big Larry energy. Hi, Big Larry. Oh, little Larry. Um, we should move into sharing stories out when we first heard it, though I think <laughs> that it might overlap a little bit with our Under the Pink stories. It does for me anyway, because I... Um, Listeners, if you want to go back to the episode, Tori Turned Me Gay, um, I, <laughs> I, I describe first hearing Tori when my sister was listening to Under the Pink, and it, was, and it was 1994, and she had borrowed cassettes from her friend, both Under the Pink and Little Earthquakes, so there was a simultaneous um, exposure to them, though I do want to say, though I connected, I connected first with Under the Pink, um, and it took me a little bit of time to really um, get little earthquakes um and when i did it was really revelatory because there's something it goes back to that diary feel um and diary mission statement of the record um but under the pink feels sort of beautifully tori calls it impressionistic um but there's an abstraction and an otherworldliness to under the pink um when when you get when you immerse yourself into little earthquakes and the reason why it remains, you know, her best, you know, though it's her first, it's been around the longest, but her best selling and the one that people will always identify her with. It's because those are songs that really, really speak to easily identifiable, relatable human experience in a way that she slowly began to, um, make more obtuse and obscure um, and sort of blend herself with character and um, metaphor a lot. Um, but Little Earthquakes is the honest, um, you know, unflinching meditations of a woman in her early 20s. Um, and and it's, um, it's extraordinary. So um, in some ways it's more discomforting because Under the Pink made me... I couldn't explain how I felt. I just knew that I felt when I was listening to it and it took some time to 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 articulate it. But Little Earthquakes, it was like, shit, I know what she's talking about in in my own way and it's hard to say aloud or even like sing the words aloud because, um, you know, it's... And it goes back to queerness for me. It goes back to being closeted. It goes back to so many of those things. Um, but... It's like once you once you repeat, like the fact that she makes you uncomfortable hearing it, and then it's so much more comforting, uh, so much more discomforting to um, repeat. Uh, shows you just the power and, and the and the um, the magic that she was up to um, with that record. So there, so I, I was exposed to both of them at the same time, but it took longer. And part of it was because I think the vulnerability and the um, plainness of little earthquakes um that's not to say that it's not incredibly complicated musically because it is um and it's so confident and the composition is amazing um the lyrics are some of the best of her career and the most iconic um but um yeah there's just something about it that like you have to really give yourself over to um the uh the discomfort in order to vibe with it and once you do it's revelatory but it can take revelatory, but it can take some time, um, especially for, for a young man, you know, like when you're closeted, when you're not supposed to be connecting with music like this. Um, yeah. So that's sort of a, you know, extension of my previous, uh, story to it. What about you, Kristen? Okay. So for me, um, discovering this album, We've touched on the coven of the older sister or the older the older group of women. Yeah. Well, girls, girls. Older group of girls. Right. Um, it was 1996 and I had this best friend. I was 12 and I had this best friend in middle school who had this super cool older sister. And I just remember being at her house this very like Texas I'm from Texas, which is my, I'm a minister's daughter. Every episode I'm going to say I'm from Texas. 
I'm from Texas, and I was in this, like, very Texas-style um, ranch house in Central Texas, very New Mexico. So it's like the tiles are kind of cold on the floor, and I'm, like, walking in between her and her sister's room, and I hear what in my memory I believe is crucify, but it's definitely little earthquakes. It's little earthquakes, and I just immediately was like, what is that? Mm-hmm. And I remember her being like, oh, my sister loves Tori Amos. And I was like, who is that? What is that? <laughs> and, you know, she would, like, take her CDs and we would listen. But it, I remember, I was like, I want to listen to all of that. We listened to all of it straight through. And then I immediately was like, I want to listen to that again. I want all of it. It was just, it was this very, like, weird kind of primal response. And I remember also thinking about the lyrics of Crucify where – to your point, Joey, it all kind of made me a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily like I was like, oh, this, I don't know. It was just this weird, like, I need to have more. I'm uncomfortable, but I like it and I want to explore. But I remember thinking like, you know, I grew up um, like my grandmother who played a major part in raising me was very religious. But to me, she was like a, a true Christian. She was a very true, like a real Christian, the real sense of like, you know, take care of and like get the shirt off your back yeah. kind of Christian teaching yeah. ESL um, in the church. <laughs> and so for me, it's not like I had a bad experience with religion, but I remember listening to Crucify and being like, why does this make me feel the way it does when I don't, I didn't necessarily have a bad experience in the church, but I think it goes back to that like systemic misogyny within the church and how you're treated as a woman. We talked about this in the last episode with Jackie strength about how these, Mm -hmm. how just women generally are treated within this church system, within organized religion. And so I think it goes back to that, but I just remember like that kind of, you know, awakening some like discomfort in me and just, um, I don't know, just starting to push back and try, trying to find my own place. Um, so thank you, Tori Ellen. So that's <laughs> my story. But it was amazing because it was like right from the the <coughs> spark. It just, it clicked in my brain immediately. It was like an on switch. There was like, there was before and there was after and there was no in between, you know? <laughs> what about you, Matthew? <laughs> That's yeah, a really good way to in the back alley in Detroit and told you yeah. the earthquakes. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> what was that as place I, called? It was called the Gold Coast. Um, <laughs> when I first heard something from Little Earthquakes, it was silent all these years. I saw the video on MTV, and mm-hmm. I it didn't capture my attention. I didn't think it was very good. I just really moved on from it really quickly. I thought, I thought the image, I thought the images, I I thought the images were really great, but I mean, like I, I was not, you know, like I, I was not listening to, you know, great music at the time. I was listening to a lot of pop music that was not good (laughs) and that's fine. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, like paying attention, paying attention to something serious was not really where I was as a human being, I was just coming out. I was young and I was discovering my identity and listening to shit like color me bad and Paula Abdul, you know, I didn't, Ooh, I, I love didn't, Paula. I, yeah. Like, but I didn't want to hear, you mm. know, the realness that Tori was trying to give me, even though right. like something in me, when I did see that felt, I felt like repelled pulsed and attracted to it because I I saw myself yeah. in it but I was like I, I can't go there <laughs> you know and yeah. um, part of it for me too um, I'm glad you brought up religion because we haven't really talked much about that but you know I was brought up and I, I wasn't brought up like super religiously but there were a lot of very You're religious also a people minister's daughter. around <laughs> me my grandfather was a Pentecostal minister Um so I had that that moment of really being able to relate to it. And I've, you know, one of the funniest things I've ever done is I've had that conversation with Tori Amos about how my grandfather was a Pentecostal minister. <laughs> it was a really, we were in Hollywood driving around and she showed me where she recorded some of Little Earthquakes, the building, and Amazing. pointed it out Iconic. to me. Um, we had a really long day. It was really fun. We spent a lot of time in the car and we were talking about my background 
and you know i was you know making all of the necessary connections about you know how similar we are and right. i i did get <laughs> to tell her something that was really fun which was like i wish that i could transport back to the year 1991 or 92 and tell matt who was a teenager that this moment would be taking place and i would actually get to you know be in the back of this car having this conversation with a person who would end up kind of really shaping my future you know what are you saying? which is wild um but no i didn't like it at first <laughs> i thought it was not good yeah. <laughs> and I, it took under the pink the drag queen experience of you know seeing <laughs> cornflake girl performed by <laughs> a legendary drag queen at the gold coast of Detroit. <laughs> and then, you know, my, my friend who, who was a drag queen, um, we wore that CD out. We listened to under the pink a lot. And then, you know, as I got really into under the pink, it, it sort of lent itself, you know, we wore his CD out. And then I think I ordered both under the pink and little earthquakes from Columbia house and then never paid for it. And they probably are still trying to collect on it. <laughs> right. The yeah, that's right. Freecreditreport.com. We can search after we can close any debts. We'll talk about it. This podcast brought to you by freedebtcollector.com. <laughs> Do you all remember, um, I don't know if it was Columbia House, it might have been, or there was another one, um, mm -hmm. another service like that in the 90s, and you could call up and you could like put in like the uh, first few letters of the musician whose album you wanted to hear clips from. It was the mm -hmm. only way you could do that, so I would like type in Tori Amos, and it would be like, <laughs> Tori Amos, boys for Pete. Oh. It, it, it would be misspelled and say, boys for Pete, and then it would say, featuring hey jupiter and then it would play like mm. 10 seconds from hey jupiter 10 seconds from called light sneeze and then you could go to the end and um and yeah, you were living time. you were living for that 10 seconds weren't you yeah well well and the thing that was so stupid about it was i had the i had the records it was like why was i calling up <laughs> it, to hear this like no it, it was, was so it weird was, it was to hear tori's name spoken in the third yeah, person i thought about was. this i thought that's about what it this was all the time you you can relate to it yeah yeah i mean i uh, I think that's in some, and I've told her this before, in some ways it's what got me into marketing. It's like the mm. excitement of something I connect so deeply, yeah. deeply with being out in the wild and feeling like you were part of something, even though we, I mean, I wasn't, I was a child, but like just yeah. feeling very connected and, and like knowing you were a part of the momentum to get something out there that got a spotlight on something. Um, Absolutely. I, I remember once back in the day when Live Journal was a thing and we used to publicly blog our journals, which is fucking stupid, everybody. Know, Why do we do I that? Know, I know. But I remember I they used to have like a list of like the top tags and it was like, um, you know, stupid shit. It's like cookies and boyfriends or whatever. The very first mm -hmm. person on the tags was Tori Amos. And I remember being like, this is to me as like a marketer. I just remember thinking that was so interesting, or a future marketer, I guess, thinking it was so interesting that this, this woman <clears throat> um, was showing up in all these places where it was like it's like proto user generated content, right? Like yeah. her fan, her fan base, like she doesn't need any additional like money put into that. Like we're there, like we lift her <laughs> up, we we drive that, or the engine behind that. So. Um, I totally understand, like, wanting to hear a little robot man say Tori Amos and play Hey yeah. Jupiter. Hell fucking yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is, why we're, this is why we're so close. This is why we're friends. Yeah. <laughs> this is why we're friends. This is why we're friends. Yeah. Um, before we start to mess, I, I do want to ask you, Maddie brought up um, imagery before, um, and Little Earthquakes is really interesting because, um, you know, it has mm. memorable liner notes and artwork um but it's it's one of the um maybe the only time right when the album artwork and the music videos are part of the same photo shoot right um for the most part right like there are images in the booklet that appear in you know um that appear in the videos um so i'm curious um is there um cindy cindy palmano was uh 
the photographer and the director um, of those videos. Um, is there a particular image or a particular video from this era that you really love or feel most, you know, like defines the era of Little Earthquakes for you um, in particular? I'm really curious because um, it's so, it's such an interesting, right? Like extension of like the videos and the booklet. Like I remember when I got the Little Earthquakes VHS, that had all the mm -hmm. videos and had those few live performances. Um, I remember being so surprised. I was like, whoa, this is like the album artwork come to life. And it was so interesting to me, right? To have that, those things what, happening. What stands out to me most is that image of her with China and the rock, the China mm. video, the rocks. And that's just because, I mean, she's spoken about it, talking about, how cool she thought it was that was her past before she knew her husband and then knowing her husband and living yeah. there but it's black and it's more or less black and white you know there's not a lot going on like the beautiful red hair just her eyes it's like very stripped down in a lot of ways there's nothing fancy about it but i think connecting her past and her future like she didn't know that she was going to be mm -hmm. Tori Amos with a capital T and an A and marry this guy and live in this place. And he was going to become so central also to her career as her sound engineer and as a major right. muse in her story. So to me, when I think little earthquakes, that's what I see. Interesting. What about you, Maddie? Yeah. You know, I, I guess I haven't really thought about it because I feel like in, in the age of, you know, listening to music on our phones, the artwork and the visual elements have become so much less at the forefront. I don't really think about them as much as mm -hmm. I used to when you had that tactile sensation of having the booklet that you could thumb through or, you know, a right. supplementary book or tour program or anything that you had with extra information on it that you had in your hands. It just feels very different now. But I think if I were to give a quick answer for me, the imagery that defines that era for me is probably the weird like phallic mushrooms. Maybe that oh, says man, something more mushrooms. about me than it does about mm -hmm. the artwork it does, itself. Yeah. But Baby. when I saw that, I was like, wow. Okay. Like it's that kind of album. I get it. Okay. <laughs> Joy, yeah. what about you? Um so you know when you're when you're young or I mean not only when you're young, it still happens now to some degree, but I think also because I've always been um such a lover of horror movies and scary imagery, mm -hmm. um I was always um my my mind couldn't make sense of that picture of her in the blue uh, nighty or blue slip at the at the piano um, with her hair in a ponytail with her back to us um, and that is a that's a picture in the booklet and I and I felt like I was like not seeing it correctly there was something about it that unnerved me and then when I finally saw the sign all these years video and it starts with her at the piano and she's moving and she turns around I'm like oh that's the back of her head and that's her body. Like there was something like just strangely, like I couldn't like, like there was something optical illusion about it, like something odd about the, about the, the, the angle and the proportions and just my, like I was seeing something else in the space, like as if I was watching, you know, like, you know, hereditary or something now, or like the exorcist, like there was something weird about it and unnerving about it. And then when I saw it, I was like, Oh, this is, not that strange of an image. I just wasn't, my mind wasn't making sense of it. You know what I'm talking about? That where if she starts and on all these years and her back is to us and she's wearing the book. And like in the, yeah, the exactly, actual, yeah. the actual image in the booklet, maybe because it's, it's just a, a still from the video, like the video footage and it's a little bit blurrier or something like that. Uh, but for some reason that stands out in my mind. Like I think of that when I think of little earthquakes, um, that sort of strange um, perspective from behind um, with, you know, with her hair back and her back to us on, and also at a piano that doesn't look like a piano that she ever performs at. Right. So there was just sort of a strangeness to the whole composition of that image that I didn't realize and understand until I saw, uh, the video. So, yeah, so mm -hmm. that, that, that one also, 
Uh, runner up is the, um, you know, her face in the box when yes. she goes in and out of the frame. And it's the of cover course. of, I think, the limited edition sound all these years that they use in the UK. So they were, they were you know, using that that long day that they must have shot all these videos for her or something and all these uh, photos that's really, um, you know, it just kind of adds to the, adds to the multimedia effect of um, Little Earthquakes. Okay, let's start messing with the master. Uh, Maddie, would you like to go first? No, Joey, I'd like to, why don't you go first? Wow. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. I will go first. <laughs> I went first so, last week. Um, okay. All right. I, I thought you'd like to go first. We're trying to I defer to you. S- like this is like slightly sexual. I'm uncomfortable. Larry and I are very uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, he looks very comfortable. Give me a break. Um, all right. So here is my my personalized track listing for Little Earthquakes. Um so this will pro- this might be a hot take or a, a surprise to listeners, but um, I envision Little Earthquakes beginning with me and a gun. Dog um, shit. And for me, me and a gun. You know, me and a gun's a difficult. Um, it's a difficult listen it's an important listen um and i imagine that there was it was tricky for tori and eric ross to figure out like where um it belongs on this record like you know how do you what do you transition from to get into the uh uh to me and a gun and then transition out of it um and based on you know our conversations and thinking about the importance of me and a gun, you know, conversations that predate the podcast. We've been talking about um, many of the things that we've discussed here today um, for years, really thinking about the importance and significance of me and a gun. Um, and I think when you have something that's that, that tough and that, um, that sort of confrontational and unflinching um, it, for me makes sense to put it out there right at the beginning Mm -hmm. and it sort of commands the listener and um, is asking them to um, sit through it at least the first time and to hear it and to really hear Tori's voice and to really um, understand that um, being a gun is emblematic of extreme hurt and trauma and also a shift for Tori um she has said that you know she was just so despondent after that assault and she um told you know I believe she told her mother that the girl and the piano were dead and she was moving away from it something in her died I think that me and a gun just is this this painful gift that we that she presents us with at the beginning um it's difficult but it's also um it's also generous it's a really generous gesture on her part um and uh, it might sound funny to use that word for it but but it is Um, so we move from me and a gun um to leather um i had noted earlier that Mm. leather um is interesting because it's touched by um, though, though, though playful, um, though musical theater esque, um, it has, um, you, you feel the, you feel the life lived, the, the trauma experience, the, um, sort of shaken, um, character who is mustering up, um, confidence in that song. Um, and it makes a lot of sense for me for leather to follow um but also to be the you know the first notes of piano feel like uh gearing up for something right like steadying the self to um now like i like i've just i've just stood naked before you that me and a gun was totally naked it's completely stripped bare there's no right. musical accompaniment right so look i'm standing naked before you right don't you want more than my sex um mm-hmm. and 
she also, you know, plays with the idea of, you know, I can't claim innocence. Um, and I love that ending where she says, in a sense, he says, you're alone here. Mm-hmm. In a sense, in a sense. Um, I love that. And, and I think it's, um, it is so good. It's so good. It's such, um, you know, it's, it, it, it could be seen as like simple or obvious wordplay, but it's, that's really clever. Um, and we go from leather into take to the sky because i think that leather um Mm. she's working through sort of this insecurity and vulnerability and then take to the sky is a real moment of um kind of turning that vulnerability and those insecurities on on their head and uh being quite powerful and she references the sword in her hand she's referencing why can't tori read she's referencing the church her father um everybody who's telling her that she should give up or she can't do this um and i think it's a really important song and you know um tori has said that when she sat down to finally write little earthquakes she had um blank envelopes and she was writing down the names of songs and the first one was russia which became take to the sky and she started writing that song so i think that it's really though though i understand the the you know it's wonderful to have sort of b-side energy and a b-side lore but i think take to the sky really feels like it deserves a place on the record particularly after the contextualization of the past 30 years the past 20 that she's really, really integrated it into her shows. It's become such a staple. It's become such a you know a song that's evolved in so many ways. Um, and I don't know. I love the sound of it. I think that the 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 mellotron and the and the drums and the um, great background vocals by the late Nancy Shank are, is so great, Beanie. Um, and we go from "Take to the Sky" to "Girl," mm. um, and from girl we go to crucify so i've sort of swapped crucify following girl makes a lot of sense to me um and sonically it really rings and from crucify we go to precious things and from precious things we go to silent all these years um and i feel like i i don't even need to um characterize these songs because we're so familiar with them and they have such a they have imprinted on us so deeply um that just the slight rearranging of their order um i I think makes sense and also um because there is such um because there is such a familiarity and such an intimacy with these songs um i was really in for large swaths of this track list i was um going based off of just the sensation and feeling and transition of Mm -hmm. the sounds themselves because one thing and this is not um, a knock on the earthquakes it is a compliment to it that it actually repeats its um, themes and its narratives over and over she is really she's working through the same problems through from different angles and different perspectives time and time again Um, and to me that like I think of I think of David Lynch. Like I love David Lynch and I think David Lynch has been making the same movie for 30 years. Like I think mm-hmm. he just keeps making a different version of the same story and why not? Right? Like right. he there's 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 something he's interested in and he keeps going back and I think Little Earthquakes does that. It does it with religion, it does it with girlhood, it does it with, with um patriarchy, misogyny, it does it with violence, it does it with sexual violence, it does it it, it does it with verbal violence. Um it does it with uh, parent-child relationships. It's all happening. It's all cycling, right? Um, it's all moving through the record. And so I uh, then go from Sound All These Years to Happy Phantom, um, which a bit of trivia in our first uh, go with this, I had removed Happy Phantom. And for some reason, um, it found its way back in. I did a slight... I did a slight reordering and then suddenly Happy Phantom felt like um, it now deserved to be back in that in that slot. Um, and a very interesting transition uh, that just works for me in the playlist. Maybe I can't quite explain it narratively, but Happy Phantom into Here in My Head. Um, and I will say on record that I believe Here in My Head is... Um, one of if not the greatest Tory B side. I think um, we all agree. We all agree this is not controversial or okay. yeah. One of our next we have a list of non canon Tory 
episodes. Yeah. Back in the day, proto proto podcast was we picked our top twenty five Tory songs, and then we had a Zoom, and we I put together the list. This is and true. I, I saw the I I like put together the overlap, and we had very little overlap. If yeah. I recall correctly, yeah. here in my head was on everybody's list. That's probably right. And when Maddie I so. and I did the Pop Matter Spotlight, and we um we had to decide like the ten best non-album tracks. I think here in my head, got the top spot. I think we came to consensus there. Um, yeah. Here in my head goes into China. China. Yeah to tear in your hand Mm -hmm. and then there is this important trilogy of songs here upside down winter and mother Mm -hmm. um and mother um goes into the final song which i kept as little earthquakes and i um remember when i saw tori when strange little girls came out uh, or when it was being released, she did a times talk, um, about the album. So the New York times had a, had a series of speakers in the arts. Um, and Tori did one for little earthquake, um, strange little girls. It was her and Ann powers in conversation. It was, I'm I'm pretty sure it was before the tour started. Um, and she, um, or was it after the tour? I think it was the beginning. I think it was before the tour. Um, I should have checked the date. I'm sorry. But uh, she was asked about mother and somebody asked her about mother in a very um, literal sense. And she said something to the effect of, yeah, it is a, it is in part about my mother, but it's really about the great mother. It's really about mother, our mother, the earth. Um, And that always stuck with me that she, part of me also thinks that she sort of dodged the question a little bit and moved. She, pivoted because she's actually quite sensitive about talking about Mary and always has been even right. Um, and, and is very careful about how she speaks about her mother in particular. I think she is like, um, sold her father down the river more often in, <laughs> in interviews, uh, for good reason. But her mother, she's always been so gentle with and so careful. I love with. It. And so she, but, but I, but I, also believed her so i think she was evading the question because she didn't want to talk about you know mary specifically but i believe her when she also says that she's connecting it with the great mother um and to me it makes sense that you know we go from um from upside down you know still coming out of your mother um to winter reckoning with her father and that very specific relationship and then going to mother um, and mother into little earthquakes where, um, you know, there, there is um, little earthquakes is so epic and I don't have to tell the listener that um, or either of you, but that song is um, such an example and she has a few of them in her catalog, but it is such an example of something, um, you know, A Little Earthquake is such an apt metaphor because there is something truly breaking apart, being swallowed, and then being reborn in that song. Um, And it makes a lot of sense to me to put it after those songs about her own birth and her own um, being parented being mothered um and then moving into little earthquakes which is this um you know the the earth literally opening up cracking um and changing everything but then restarting right um and here in new york just two weeks ago we had an actual earthquake here and the first thing that my gay ass thought of was little earthquakes <laughs> like, of course of course of you course did. It did right <laughs> um but yeah so that's um yeah yeah uh but that's my track listing um and but i feel i really implore everybody to listen to that <laughs> upside down winter mother into little earthquakes it is my i favorite. love that it's my favorite Joey. sequence um and i think it doesn't need a lot of explanation i'm sort of grasping a bit to explain it but you know i know that amongst friends and ears with feet you don't quite have to you just have to you know um, 
gesture towards it and we get it so that I is that is how that is how i messed with one of the comments recently was like this is for the hardcore fan we don't have to say shit other than it's for the hardcore fan yeah they know and i i really appreciate the engagement that that's been happening too on social media where Thank people you. are referencing and like things that we're talking about and telling us how they feel about it and, and um that's really really invigorating to hear what people think about our um individual journeys through the albums i feel like matt's ready to mess are I you tell. i can tell, I could I can be. tell. there's like a look there's like a look <laughs> really is it a come hither yeah. look? the look I... of that the look of mess is in his eyes there's something it... Is it a look that says, why did we both wear neon lime green onto this podcast without I'm communicating that to one it. another? I think that's L- the look most... I'm Listener, they requested that I change into something lime green and I neon green and wanted to just tell you that I do not have anything in if that color. If you are audio only, Matthew and I match. It wasn't planned. <clears throat> Secondly, if you're audio only, go to YouTube. Third... <laughs> One of the first things Matthew ever said to me, IRL, was, you look great in chartreuse. So, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Did I really? God, yes. I'm, but now, but I'm now so complimentary. about tourmaline, tourmaline <laughs> dreams. And it's, like, not true. I'm wearing but I, my like, several... <laughs> oh, Of course you of are, course bitch. You are. Of course is it you a bro- are. Did it get fixed? I fixed it. Or is yeah. it a... Okay. Mm-hmm. Um... If you haven't, if you haven't hit the YouTube yet, please do because Matthew and I match. But yeah, you like one of the first things IRL you said to me after after the the New York days and the Texas days, you were like, "You look great in chartreuse," and it happened like a few more times where I was like, "This is my color." So I don't okay, disagree. Um, I don't disagree. I think it's time to. <laughs> think it's time for it's time for messing. We can go Let's on. Let's do it. I love you. Okay. So for me, as I mentioned, the album is an origin story and it's one of the greatest uh, capturings of the birth of a star. It's a brilliant snapshot of the path that she had to take up until that point to get to that place of release, whether that's the album release or, you know, Mm -hmm. not not the literal sense. Um, I think it's a really interesting snapshot. And because it's so personal and so intimate, I think only a major rock star could do that kind of self self mythologizing. <laughs> um, you have to have brass balls to be able to put yourself out there like that. I, I can't imagine. I have trouble if somebody gives me feedback on something I wrote, you know, like let alone putting your entire life. I know you do out there. I don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not good at it. It's not a democracy in my mm. world, as you know. But That's right, honey. <laughs> I have to give her a lot of credit for that because, you know, it's it, it's just uh, an extraordinary effort from somebody who came from seemingly nowhere and just exploded like a like the birth of a star. So um, the work of a master storyteller it's it's hypernatural. It's extremely complex, but it is still emotionally relatable. There's an emotional. Um, uh, through line a a level of emotions that are so uh easy to identify with especially if you were hearing it as you were coming into your own identity i think it really put words to things that were maybe hard to explain i know for me as a queer person coming out in the early Mm -hmm. 1990s um she was speaking to to me directly with a lot of the the turns of phrases or the way she was saying things I, i really relate and the excitement um the questions there were a lot of questions on the record so anyway i start the record with precious things and i mm-hmm. can't imagine any of the to me that is the tori amos song right it is the tori amos song and the way it sort of um transports you uh the instrumentation is so it's so signature and it's so tori it tells you a lot almost everything you need to know about her. So from there I go into leather and 
I think after the bombastic nature of Precious Things and the drums and the uh, crashing emotions, I think it's good to get into that that place of um, owning your confidence a little bit. And I think Leather does a really great job of that. And also something I, I know mm-hmm. I mentioned this when we first recorded, but I'm going to mention it again because I don't think it can be said enough. Tori Amos from the very beginning has put some really funny things out there. She's a really funny woman and leather Mm -hmm. is one of those songs that has some of those moments of cheekiness or, you know, just really, uh, acid humor where it's a little bit shocking and a little bit off putting, um, to hear what she's singing about. And I think she does it again later on the record with happy phantom. She has her tongue firmly planted in her cheek. And I think that's a great quality about her that people often miss when they're, you know, getting lost in these other songs, which are a lot more serious a lot of the time. But she's always had funny moments on all of her records. So I think it's important to have that Mm -hmm. after Precious Things because Precious Things is a super intense song. So from there we go to Crucify. And I was re-listening to Crucify this afternoon and what a absolutely dynamic song and when i heard it the first time that's when the the matt who you know had a grandfather who was a pentecostal minister was like "Ooh, should i be listening to this is it is it blasphemous you know (laughs) and it's it's interesting because you know i went to a christian school growing up and i've kept in contact with a lot of those folks throughout the years and i always think like kristen said of her grandmother that these are actually you know, people who are out there practicing what they preach and, you know, the ones who are like that really can get into Tori, I think, um, and Mm -hmm. her for what she is, is somebody questioning, which if you're a Christian person, I think something, um, my grandfather once told me was he was always curious about everything and he always wanted to ask questions about everything even if it wasn't for him. So- love that too. I really love that. My my Grammy was very much the same way. I think there is something about the old world that maybe like drew our family into religion where it's like they're like scholarly and they're interested mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that was the tech. So that's right. what they went to. But yeah. there's something so deep in there. Like my grandmother in 2024 would be boss bitch doing cool shit. You know, it just wasn't the world when they were adults. Yeah. Right. And I think that people okay, who what comes uh, after understand Matthew? religion know that it's okay to question it. I think it's the people who don't understand it, who get it wrong <laughs> and who think that anybody who questions it or provokes a discussion that involves God right. that they're blasphemous or doing something wrong. So um, that song for me was yes. probably one of the ones that I first really, outside of Silent All These Years, really felt a really strong personal connection to because it really I felt like it spoke my language. So from Crucify, we go to Little yeah. Earthquakes, the title track, and I like that up front. Um, mm. Joey, I think you... You said everything that there needs to be said about Little Earthquakes. What else can we say about it? It's just yeah. stunning. From there, I go into Upside Down. Uh, from mm. Upside Down into Mother. From Mother, yep. I go into Me and a Gun. Um, Whoa, I think that's yeah. That's a, yeah, a bracing moment, I think. Um, yes. Yeah. A wake up moment. And for me mm-hmm. and a gun, I go to here in my head. Uh, the aftermath oh, that's a good transition. of, you know, reckoning oh. with what has just happened. It's, I think, a really powerful pairing there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I've seen Tori perform here in my head live many, many times, as I'm sure many of the people watching or listening have. And, um, you know, there have been a couple of performances where... I just, I saw her performing it and it was like she had, she was in a different universe. I think with that song, I've seen her really go to some really incredible places just as a, as an artist and a performer. Um, 
Can I just say um, something about here in my head that's really interesting? I've only heard it a few times live, but I've heard a lot of bootlegs and seen versions of it. And it's one of those songs where like you think that you need to have the bombastic, do you know what this is doing to me? But some of the best performances have been her not giving you that and instead Mm -hmm. losing herself in a really quiet yearning. Um, And it's one of those songs where like, if you don't get the ending that you were hoping for, it's still really satisfying. She finds a way to still deliver that ending, even if she doesn't deliver it in the way that you think you want it. Right. It's like very Plus specific thing. to all of that. That song yeah. is a whole fucking, we could do a whole app on that. Whole app on here in my head. We yeah. won't, we won't, but that's somebody else's you. wheelhouse, but yeah. Yes. Go ahead. That's Maddie. our song to Tori Amos. Song to Tori Amos friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, from here in my head, we go into girl. Um, I ride to work every morning like that, wondering like why. Um, every time same I'm bitch. riding in a car going yeah, to work, please. I say the same thing to myself. <laughs> um, same. Every time day. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, from girl, we go to China. Uh, from China, mm-hmm. we go to tear in your hand. Tear in your hand into flying Dutchman. Uh, Dutchman Ooh. into Happy Phantom. Happy Phantom into Silent All These Years. Silent All These Years Whoa. into Take to the Sky. And finally, we close out with Winter. Whoa. And that That's a great is track list, Maddie. the messing that I came up with. And it, Matthew. It's, Basically the same as what I had in our first go round. I did a little rearranging through the midsection to work out a couple of things. Yeah. But for me, I again, like I just. Way. Me too. How yeah. How do you guys remember this shit? We have it How written do down, girl. Okay. I, I'm, okay. <clears throat> We're going to, I'm going to talk a bit about winter when I, when I go, but like, tell me about like ending with winter. Like that, that yeah. stands out to me. Like, talk to me about that. Yeah. I'm curious mm-hmm. about that too. I think winter you don't know, is, made it up. Yeah. Well, we all winter, made it up <laughs> as, as we, we go, go along. along. Oh boy, here we go. Um it's a cathartic song and I think um the storytelling there is really beautiful. It's really personal. The orchestration and the size of the song match the emotions of the song. It could mm-hmm. have been, you know, that song could have not been good. It could have been yeah. a, a yeah. weak yeah. ass song about a girl with daddy issues, right? And <laughs> seriously, we'll talk, and about, we'll talk about mine. We'll talk about mine. We'll go. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, let's let's talk about all of ours. Um, but <laughs> you know, I think the the instrumentation, the composition, the lyrics, all of it just really are. It's all very elevated. Uh, and strong, you know, it's a strong right. statement and it just, it feels to me like a great closer because it's just got those big emotions. It asks again, big questions. When are you going to make up your mind? When are you going to love mm. you as much as I do? That line was another one that really stood out to me when I first started listening to Tori, when I first started listening to this record in particular and she has a habit of putting those questions in her songs. You can find them throughout her entire catalog. And, you know, anybody who's in, in the headspace of listening to little earthquakes, when that song comes on, that's a big question to ask yourself. Right. So I, um, I, I think that's a really good question to ask yourself. So, uh, I like putting it at the end for that reason. Cause I think when you leave the listening session, and you're left with that question, I think I think that could really work some positive magic in people's lives. And it definitely has, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, when are you when are you going to love you as much as I do, I think is a really just like it's so powerful. Right. Like even the most amazing, even the most talented, beautiful, confident young woman or man or person um, can sometimes feel extremely insecure and it's okay. I love that. Yeah. 
So that is my Little Earthquakes playlist, right, and I'm happy with it. Kristen Keys, mess with the master, please. You lime green Let's goddess. Messy, messy. You lime green god. Um. Okay, so just for the the background for our listeners, we were supposed to do American Doll Posse tonight. Thing, some things didn't go as planned. But Joey had made this comment where he was like, last last episode you were like, oh, me, Kristen, you're so uh, committed to story. And I am. Going yeah. forward, I'm not saying I won't be committed to like the story and the narrative, but I do want to try to do things differently. However, Little Earthquakes is one of the ones where <laughs> <laughs> I think it make, it's just an easy way to go. Um, and I, I wasn't also, trying to inhibit you from doing it. I, just I know was, you were. I was just noticing that you were being very literary, and I. I know, that. and when you said that, I was like, my literary professor friend is gonna. I'm gonna bring this up, and he's gonna be like, "Oh fuck, I scared her off," and you did. But um, it's okay. So, little earthquakes is I broke it up basically into like childhood and adulthood, and I I, I do need to say that like. I think Little Earthquakes is perfect as is. And I don't think anybody who actually listens to our podcast thinks that we are saying that things aren't perfect as is. Right, right, right. But uh, it is important for me to say that because um, this album flows perfectly. The story is so deep for me. So doing this is like a real exercise in breaking it apart and having fun with it. All that being said, first song, obviously Precious Things. Let's go. Open a tour with it. Yes, ma'am. Open an album with it. Yes, ma'am. So easy. I actually don't think it needs much. To, it, there's not, not much to say. The end. Precious things. We start. Second, we go into Crucify. And so we're going to start in this, um, this like wounded place, this childhood place of like reckoning with yourself, reckoning with religion. Um, reckoning with the ways that you were raised and starting to question those that's crucify for me and then we go into yeah a trinity and a bonus of winter mother girl and i don't think that you like for the hardcore fans as our friend said i don't think you need much explanation there but winter mother girl you know the reckoning of the relationship with the father the mother and then the being your own person, I think makes sense. I need to say, Matthew, you changed my relationship with winter and I doubt you remember this. I actually wrote Tori about it last time. I know I just, last time we saw Tori Ellen, I wrote her a a little note and I was like, you know, I'd asked for crazy in Phoenix 2022 and you forgot the words couldn't see anything took your glasses off played winter for a second and then you played crazy finished it and it's not a song i've ever identified with because i don't have a relationship with my father i don't think about that song very much and but my daughter <laughs> requests these long set lists as matthew and i like to say every night and after that show I started singing winter. I was like, this is a great bedtime song for my daughter who (laughs) is absolutely obsessed with her dad. And so I started singing winter and it has made me love that song. And I remember one day sitting with you at my kitchen table and I was like, Ellis, um, you know, said this song, she said, I want you to sing the song that makes me think of my dad. And I, Mm -hmm. her dad also sings her songs at bedtime and I, I know Kel knows, he knows um, uh, what, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. He knows that song. <laughs> and he knows Big Rock Candy Mountain, which has a lot to do with like bums and cigarette trees and hobo. I don't even know. But I was thinking, like I was wrecking my brain being like, what song reminds her of her dad? And then I, I said, Winter. And she said, yes. And I remember you, Matt, she, you were like, she's four years old. That's kind of like advance that she understands it's a song about her father and I thought it was really sweet but it's been a song that I've probably sang to her every night since and it has 
legitimately changed my relationship with that song. And I know that Tori has said for herself, you know, she saw herself as a child and she saw her own daughter, but that's been so empowering for me. And I didn't put them to bed tonight because we're doing the podcast, but I did do it last night. And I think about you every night as one of my absolute best friends when I sing that song to her. And it's so lovely to me, the ways in which like relationships, friendships, um, can like kind of supersede what you're dealt with biologically maybe that I sing mm. the song to my daughter who loves her dad and I love it and I think about my one of my best friends Matthew telling me how sweet it is so I just need to like I'm like I'm gonna cry I don't know what's wrong with me anyway oh. I love you boys both very much but you you single-handedly changed my relationship with that song and I told our friend Tori Ellen about that last time we saw her Oh, she probably um, she okay, probably so loved she probably loved that. She probably loved that. You are such an ass kisser. <laughs> Did she love it? I am not an ass. I need her to know these things. These think like can you imagine somebody like you write these songs, you go out there, you perform, and like you change somebody's relationship with how they see their own life and their own children's lives like that's fucking incredible i sing this song to my daughter every night now and i love it that's very um, sweet though and just being able to give that to my own daughter that's i fucking love you i love you boys Aww. um i've lost the plot wait so is that song number two that's song number three precious crucified precious winter things. got it got it I'm mother sorry. we're a mother we get it y'all mother is oh god Such, we don't even need to talk about mother Incredible, perfect, iconic, good. probably my favorite song on Little Earthquakes generally. Mm -hmm. Whew, that song is timeless. Any album, it literally could be 2024, it could be 1994, 92. Thank you, ma'am. Girl, everybody else's girl. We go to Upside Down. Mm. So Upside Down is then followed by Silent All These Years. And I've marked this in my notes as a transition between childhood and adulthood. Mm. And this is where shit gets real um to me there's like a rebirthing that happens in your adulthood life um and so to me <laughs> we go into leather and um i think it's funny because i think of all this like slutty time in college we had look i'm standing naked before you, you know? <laughs> like this just ho-ish mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. uh like you're stripping yourself sometimes physically but emotionally and just uh rebuilding yourself i guess in some ways um then we go to china and we start to really experience in this adult section for me it goes china here in my head this is going to be this is going to be dense china mm -hmm. here in my head tear in your hand take to the sky um hmm. there's just a lot of like growing up here a lot of like uh loving and loss and dealing with like the complexities of adulthood and disappointment and um breakups and all of that stuff so with the so there are next few songs after take to the sky we go to me and the gun little earthquakes and that's i i, I marked childhood early adulthood and then i wrote trauma in real life that's when like real life hits you like a ton of bricks now that doesn't happen for everybody in that way in that order but just that that concept of like growing up and there's an innocence and then a, like a little bit of like peeling back the veil mm -hmm. experimenting mm -hmm. with real life and then oh shit this like hit me like a ton of bricks and um if you guys remember from the first episode from Earthquakes, I did a secret track, which was Ode to the Banana King. And that's just because I think it's fucking incredible to to go into Ode to part two of the song, Pretty Good Year, into the next album. Mm -hmm. um, and I did want to add some of those B-sides other than like Here in My Head and Upside Down and stuff. I just think so, so many of those to me are Little Earthquakes trademark. So... Um, but at the end, I wrote three themes. I wrote release, rebirth, rebuild. And I think that's it. That's good. Love it. Thanks, guys. I like that a Thank lot. You. 
The end. <sighs> Good stuff. Mm. Um, I feel like I surprised you with my vulnerability. <laughs> you did. Our <laughs> listeners are are really appreciative. Well, of you um, opening up like that. Listen, I I, I think I think, I think so. it brings it's little I earthquakes, th- man. That's what I'm saying. This is listen. Our our diary as friends is this podcast, right? So we're yes. telling our own stories mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. through this podcast, like very much like Little Earthquakes. And our stories have been intertwined for a long time. We've known each other for a long time. And um, that's, I think, one of the, you know, we're very yeah. motivated by numbers, obviously, but it's great to be able to set specific time aside <laughs> and make something creative with your friends and have conversations with your friends about these memories you have that are deeply connected to them and this music that you love so much. And, you know, one of the things that I love so much about Tori is that for me, uh, one of the most profound things is, uh, she taught me, I, I give Tori credit for teaching me how to have my own voice and how to how to be a storyteller mm. and it all starts with this record you know i you guys know this but i've been writing a, a memoir a, a script about my my own life and my own experience and i always go back to that quote that tori says about writing your diary once and then never doing it again you have one shot at it to tell mm-hmm. people who you are more than likely if Do you get well, that shot yeah. yeah so you need to get it right so i i think about that so much um so tonight's discussion just makes me think more about um, being able to tell these stories and having people that we know or that we don't know, complete strangers, comment and say, hey, you know, I, I had a similar experience. It's, it's a really cool thing. Um, it's good to be connected yeah. to that group. And you guys. I, just, I need to thank you boys for being like such strong male figures in my children's lives because yes they have an amazing dad but i love that they have a uh a group of men as well like i i mean i had a very strong group of women but i didn't have men and i just love Mm -hmm. that my boys that my my babies both have all the boys you know i love that Mm -hmm. i love you boys it's sweet we love you too it's the whiskey it's the whiskey but also you know it's also the album i mean i think that I don't want to speak for the both of you, but I think if we had to like take a informal poll, it probably, I would probably be right if I guess that most of us don't like listen, don't go back and listen to little earthquakes, you know, that often. Um, I, I sort of am, am of the, I, I have a lot of recency bias when it comes to Tori. Like I've been listening to her Me for too. so long that yes. I really tend to like listen to newer albums uh, you know, over the past few years more frequently um, in part because um, you know, I used that word imprinted before, but those early records really are just imprinted on me. Like I kind of like hear them. I can hear them in my yes. head um, whenever, whenever I want to, you know what I mean? Like and yes. I, I, I can even, you know, call up live version specific moments in my mind at any time it's just like i I wonder god what what would i accomplish if there was if the space in my brain that was not taken up by all this tory stuff um what would i be doing right now right i think about Um, it all the time we'd be like doctors we'd be like solving world hunger fuck yeah um but (laughs) but i so so i so i so i feel very much like um the newer material you know is what I listen to when I'm calling up a, a Tory song. Um, but um, that said, you know, revisiting Little Earthquakes is a reminder of um, just how truly special and truly unique and one of a kind. Um, it, it's such a moment. It, it's a moment in time for us individually, but it's a moment in time in music um Mm -hmm. and this is where this is where it started and this is where we can point to and say the this is a real contribution that she made to the culture to the um the genre or creating a genre of her own right Mm -hmm. um but this is really where it started and it's interesting to do this um, short, you know, a week after talking about Choir Girl, which we all mm. have such reverence for, and we were 
singing its praises about the fact that it was truly doing something new and tapping into the zeitgeist and hitting at the right moment. Little Earthquakes is the example of um, a record that was imposing itself on a moment that maybe didn't want it. And she, and, but it was having its time and it was coming and she was, um, you know, back to that, like selling of the record, that politicking that she was doing, that connecting and that insistence. There's an insistence that this album is going to exist and it's going to survive and it's going to thrive and it's going to last and it's going to be passed down through generations. And just look at this sort of emotional response that we have even discussing it, right? So we might not listen to it that often, but the 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 um, impact that it's had on us is undeniable. And I think that's what makes it so special. Absolutely. And let's, yeah, I'm with you there. Let's, let's also just say one more time, Joseph, you and I uh, had a feature in our Pop Matters Tori Amos performer spotlight that goes into a little bit more detail, and I can Mm -hmm. dig that up and share it. But Tori created her own language with this album. Let's talk about that for just a second and let that settle in because it sustained her now for 30 years. She created a musical, lyrical language. You know when you hear a Tori Amos yep. record that it's Tori Amos. You know that voice. And that's what she did. That's the groundwork right. she laid with this album. That's why she worked her ass off to make sure it was a success and to make sure that that longevity yep. and that role as a legacy artist was going to be preserved. And she did a very bang up job. Yeah, absolutely. And it is so many musicians strive to create their own vocabulary their own you know their their own space that's mm-hmm. genuinely them and sometimes it takes a few records not for tori she came sort of you know she fully formed from under a stone or something but that <laughs> was actually the result of 30 years of hard work you know she was you know if, if her mother and father to be believed you know she wasn't even two and she was composing so um this is truly the cult little earthquakes is the culmination of something and the beginning of something at the same time right. which is pretty which is pretty amazing right that's ins- i never thought of it that way you're right favorite moments so for me the the moment of the album is the lyric from precious things so you can make me come that doesn't make you jesus that lyric slaps today i mean that lyric there's nothing like it we always end up talking about sex at the very end. What's wrong with you? It's Tori's fault. Ugh. I mean, it, it's not even really about sex, that lyric. That lyric is about power. No, 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 no. You're it right. It's about power. Yeah. So it, that's it my is... moment. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, mic drop. What else is there to say? Um, <laughs> how about you, Kristen? Like my moment, my moment's going to seem so boring, but I, I've thought about, again, I have, I guess I have a type, but that moment in mother when she's just like vocalizing Mm -hmm. and she's, you know, again, you can like hear her, her jaw clenched and she's like, "Hmm." I don't know. I just. It feels timeless to me. I feel like it could be any year, any age of yeah. Tori. I, it just feels so raw. But it feels like that person's in the room with you. Um, that vocalizing at the end of Mother for me is just chef's kiss. What about for you, Joseph? Well, my so obviously if we're going to, we're going to acknowledge you can make me come as make you Jesus. We have to also acknowledge, give me life, give me pain, give me myself again. Uh, But my favorite moment on the whole record is also from mother. And it's, um, it's across the sky. It's across my Mm. heart, across my legs. Oh my God. God. Is she a genius? Quiet first, my left foot. I mean, just so I mean, it's an out, you know, once again, an album full of moments. I mean, there's that break in tearing your hand, caught a ride with the moon, where the piano mm. pedal hits and releases, mm. and um, the you know, 
haze all the clouded up my mind in the days of the oh, white could never be. You say, you say, you know, you wish, and your baby, 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 babies, I tell you. Um, and what an unorth, and what a strange, um, what a strange structure for a song too, right? We barely mean talk about uh, a tear in your hand. That is the great. When I talked to Eric Ross, um, I said, I'm curious. What song do you think would should have been a single, should have been a hit, should have been on movie soundtracks? And I wrote down a Tear in Your Hand because that's what I was going to say to him. And he said, oh, Tear in Your Hand, 100%. <laughs> so even they knew, like, this should have been, like, like on a soundtrack. It should have been, like, it's such a, I mean, there's just so many moments. Girls, Bridge, um, oh. the ending of Girl. I mean, we can go on and on and on. But for me, that moment is Mother... I crossed my le- I crossed my legs. Oh my god, that's just so good, so 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 good. Ah, oh, we've done it again. Another two hour. We've ep. done Dear it, listeners. I can't wait to edit this two hour episode. <laughs> you, you don't have to edit much. Just just a few, just a few blips. Except when my internet went out, which our friends will never know, but my internet went out. I anyway. think it'll be okay. Um. So everybody, please um, hit us up on social media, Messing with the Master on Instagram, follow us on YouTube, uh, subscribe to the podcast, rate, review it, five stars only. Let's get that. Let's let let's let's let let's let the algorithm wave take us away, if you will. Um, mm. But mostly take engage with us. We with love you. we love hearing from you all and knowing what you think about our. What do you think of how we messed with the master um, and what your your preferences are? Um, engage with us. Tell us what's going on. Um, this is you know for us, but also we really want to engage. And I keep using the word engagement, but um, but I mean it. We really want to interact. We want to know um, what you're thinking and what your relationship is to this this record. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tell us. <laughs> How has it evolved over the years? I'm curious. I yeah. really did not think that I could connect with a song like I did with Mother in 2023. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so tell us. I want to hear all about it. Yeah. All right, guys. Love you. Awesome. Good, Good night. night. Bye. No one dared, no one cared to tell me where the pretty girls are, those demigods. Hit me nine inch your nails, a little fascist plenty sucked inside the heart of every nice girl. Shoot.